eu tava, o Dom escreveu o livro Wiki... É, bem, o Dom, Dom Tep Scott é uma das maiores autoridades mundiais de inovação, mídia e impacto socioeconômico de tecnologia no século XXI. Ele é autor e coautor de diversos best-sellers, entre eles o aclamado Economics. Eu estava conversando com ele antes da palestra, e ele me disse o seguinte, que ele gostaria de dizer para vocês que ele escreveu 15 livros, sendo que o primeiro deles foi em 1981, é, sempre falando sobre a revolução digital. E ele acabou de lançar, o seu último livro acabou de sair semana passada, chamado Radical Openness. Então você já pode é, comprar esse livro, Radical Openness é um livro do TED. E o livro que ele falou que ele mais gosta, tá certo? É o Growing Up Digital. Tá certo? Então... Ah! Hey, Dom. Here a little tux for you. A Linux tux. Me deram vários mascotes da área de software livre aqui, eu não sei como é que eu vou distribuir, eu vou pensar num jeito aqui depois. Então, beleza. E ele acha que o livro mais importante para vocês lerem é o que diz Macroeconomics. Então, sem mais delongas, com vocês, Don Tapscott. Valeu. Obrigado. 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 It's not turned on. Is it on the back? Test. Não está funcionando. I'll just take a hand mic. For a hand mic? Yeah. Check. Test. It's not working. It's not turned on. Turn it on. Is it off? Okay, give me a hand mic then. Yeah. Oh, that's terrible. Yeah. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. And this is not working either. <laughs> Hand mic? Hand mic? Hand mic. Obrigado. <laughs> Obrigado. Uh, boa noite. Um, uh, muito bom estar aqui. Unfortunately, those are the last words that you will hear of your beautiful language coming from my mouth. I speak restaurant Portuguese. Pastéis de nata. Pacayao. No. Seriously, I'm uh, delighted to be here. This is the second time I've spoken at a campus party. And I've been to Brazil probably uh, 15 or 20 times in my life, and I love this country. Uh, the topic uh, that I was going to speak to you about today is the topic called Radical Openness. And this is uh, the topic of my new book that just came out uh, five days ago. It's a TED book, and it's a multimedia book. So you can go and order it right now. And the best way to order it is in very large quantities, thousands of quantities. Christmas is coming soon. No, I'm very proud of this book, but rather than talking to you about it today, I'm going to talk about something different. Uh, because um, on Twitter, there's a hashtag called Coffee with Dawn. And every time I come to Brazil, I have some friends that meet with me and have a coffee. Last night, We had some beer, and, um, and they convinced me over the discussion to speak about something different. So what I'm going to talk to you about is a modest little topic of how do we solve the world's problems differently. Now, I want to be very clear. In the next 55 minutes, I am not going to solve all of the world's problems, okay? I'm going to talk to you about our model of solving problems. And I'm going to make the case to you that Campus Party is not what you think it is. Campus Party is part of a new kind of networked organization that's critical to ensuring that the smaller world that our children inherit is a better one. 
Now, I have a big task, so let me get at it. I've got 50 minutes to do this. This is the book again, in case you didn't order it yet. We have a lot of problems, to be very serious. Poverty, let's take something like climate change. Last week I was at Davos in Switzerland, a big meeting. And um, at a previous Davos, Bill Clinton said to a small group of us, if we reduce carbon emissions by 80% in the year 2050, it's still gonna take a thousand years for the planet to cool down. And in the meantime, you can expect some bad things to happen. Like there'll be a billion and a half people who lose half of their water supply. So this is a big problem. And in the short term, it doesn't even matter what we do, the world is going to suffer. And many, many millions of people are going to suffer because of this. But there are countless other problems. Conflict in the world, infectious disease, racism, economic volatility. We've got species extinction. Water is a huge problem. And do you know what the main source of pollution of the oceans is today? Freshwater rivers. The Amazon, the Mississippi, and other rivers are dumping millions of tons of toxins and pollutants into the oceans. And over time, this is killing the oceans. We've got environmental destruction, human rights violations, sexual violence as a horrible case of the rape that occurred in India. And where the main prosecutor got up, this is the prosecutor prosecuting the criminals that raped and ultimately resulted in the death of this young woman, saying, oh, I never met a young woman who was raped who, you know, didn't really deserve it. So there are a lot of problems in the world. Now, who here thinks that all of these problems are getting better and that we're solving them? Any hands? Who thinks that we're not making a lot of progress? Hands? Okay, that's most of you. Would anyone say that on most of these problems, it's getting worse? Hands? Many of you. And there's a big crowd at the back there that agrees with that. So, are these problems too hard to solve? Or is our model wrong? Well, what's our model? Our model came out of the end of the Second World War, when 42 countries met together at a small New Hampshire town called Bretton Woods, in this resort, and they decided that we need to have a series of global institutions to govern the planet. And they created the World Bank and what became the International Monetary Fund. They also, this led to the creation of the United Nations, the GATT, the Global Agreement on Trades and Tariffs, the WTO, the G8, the G20. What are these things? They're global institutions based on nation states. And if you go to a meeting of any of these institutions, the only people who can vote or even speak are the, repre the formal representatives of countries. If you go to any one of these meetings, you are not allowed to speak and you have no voice. Now, this is our model that we've had for 60 years, and it's a model that increasingly isn't working. On the other hand, there are a whole set of new drivers that are causing us to think fundamentally differently about how we solve global problems, cooperate, and govern ourselves on this planet. Now, the first is a technology revolution, and you're part of it here today. The internet, the social web of today, is really a giant computational platform. It's a computer that we all program. Not just campesinos, but anytime anybody goes onto the internet and they do a Google search, or they upload a photo onto Pinterest, or they remix a video or a, 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 a music file, they're programming this global computer. Humanity is building a machine. And this machine radically drops transaction and collaboration costs. And it means that people can collaborate together 
on an astronomical scale. And they could do many, many things. And I'll come to that in a second. The second big change is a demographic revolution. Most of you in this room were born after 1977, or many of you. You're part of the echo of the baby boom. And you're the first generation to grow up using digital technology. My generation grew up watching television. Your generation are not the passive recipients of content. You're the actors, the initiators, the composers, the rememberers, the authenticators, the builders, the scrutinizers, the authenticators. And there's no more powerful force to change every institution in society than the first generation of digital natives. I'm a digital immigrant. I had to learn the language. Now, I studied 11,000 young people in 10 countries, including Brazil. This is the first ever global generation. And the reason is because generations in different countries around the world, young people never had a way of communicating, and today you do. Now, the third big change that's underway is a social revolution. And it's not just that there are a billion people on Facebook. Social media is becoming social production. This is not about hooking up online. This is a new means of production that's underway. And it's beginning to change not just the way that we collaborate and communicate and fall in love and date and inform ourselves about what our friends are doing. It's beginning to change the deep structure and architecture of the corporation, of how we orchestrate capability to innovate, to create goods and services. So you look out here, a campus party, and there are people from many different organizations collaborating together to solve a problem, to create wealth, to, to create a new startup. And this is a time of great entrepreneurship, and you can see that in Brazil because little companies can now have all the capability of big companies without all the liabilities, like a deadening bureaucracy, legacy culture, legacy systems, and so on. So this is causing an economic revolution where the institutions that we have for creating wealth are unbundling into networks. Now the next big change is that this is creating a huge opportunity for us to rethink many parts of civilization. So before I go into it, I'm going to ask you to come with me for five minutes on a little trip in history back a few hundred years ago. A few hundred years ago, all around the world, a hundred years ago in Brazil, there was an agrarian economy. 150 years ago, there was a political system called feudalism. And the only people who had knowledge in the society were the kings and nobles. They were the Portuguese church and the Portuguese state. And there was no concept of progress. You, just bore, you were born, you lived your life, and you died. And in France, you had kings and nobles and the church that were the, only, the powerful oligopoly that controlled things in society. Well, along came Johannes Gutenberg with his great invention, the printing press. And over time, different parts of the society began to acquire knowledge. And when they did, it didn't make sense for the church, for, for example, to be responsible for medicine. It didn't make sense for a bunch of kings and and nobles and clerics in Portugal to be running the population of Brazil. So you had, all around the world, there were these national democratic revolutions. Bolivar, uh, the French Revolution. The American Revolution was essentially this. A new rising class of people who had information saying, we, want, we don't want to be subjects anymore. We want to control our own destiny. And eventually that led to the corporation, the creation of science, the university, the nation state, 
all the states across Latin America, for example. We saw the right, Italy wasn't a nation state until 150 years ago. We saw the creation of the corporation, of commercial relationships, the industrial revolution, and it was all good. But today, something very important is happening, and you're in the heart of it. There's a new medium of human communications that's even more important than the printing press, that's revolutionizing every institution. The printing press gave us access to the written word. The internet enables each of you to be a publisher. The printing press gave us access to recorded knowledge. The internet gives us access not just to knowledge, but to the intelligence contained in the crania of other people in a big room or on a global basis. This is not an information age. It's an age of networked intelligence. And this is challenging our fundamental political structures all around the world. The nation state was a good idea, and nation states will not go away, not in my lifetime. But we created Brazil. There was a national economy. There were borders. There was a language, a sense of national culture. There were institutions of parliament, democracy, a currency, an external policy, a foreign policy, nation states for national economies. Except increasingly, we have a global economy. So the nation state and its institutions are not the right size to look at global problems. So all of this is creating a burning platform in the world. We need to rethink how to solve problems in the world because our traditional institutions can't do it. You know the idea of a burning platform? You're somewhere where the costs of staying where you are all of a sudden become much greater than the costs of going to something else. Even though the new state may be unknown. You're on an oil rig. It's on fire. You have to get off the oil rig even though the costs of doing that are unknown. And that's where we are in the world today. Okay, so thank you very much for being patient. Let me get to the point. Who here has watched the Coney 2012 video? Hands, please hold them up. Who has not watched this video? Okay, more than half of you. Homework assignment, number one, go and watch this video. It's 30 minutes, but you'll find it very interesting. It's about the Ugandan warlord, Joseph Kony. He's a bad guy. He's kidnapped 60,000 children. The girls become sex slaves. The boys become soldiers. If they disobey, he'll cut their face off. If they disobey, they have to go kill their own families. He's a bad guy. So this new multi-stakeholder network called Invisible Children said, we're going to make Joseph Kony famous. I saw this video on a Monday afternoon, months ago. By Friday of the same week, oh, by the way, when I saw it on Monday, 12,000 people had seen the video. When I saw it on Friday, 81 million people had seen the video. And they succeeded. They made Joseph Kony famous. Half of the people in this room know who he is. There's no television show. Joseph Coney is famous, and he's on the run now, and he's being hunted down. So this is amazing. It's inspired, but is this the new model of how we solve problems? It may be inspired, but is it legitimate? Who's it accountable to? You can say what you like about the United Nations, at least it's accountable to the nation states that are in turn accountable to us. How do you change the policy? Is it right to have more US troops in Uganda? Is that the way to solve the problem of warlords? So for every one of these new models, there are a number of questions. Let me give you another example. Anonymous. I saw some anonymous signs and pictures and faces around here. Notice how they take the logo of the United Nations, the old model, 
and they put their new logo on it. Now, Anonymous is a powerful force. It's like a biological sort of ecosystem as opposed to a, an organization. And they've wreaked havoc with corporations and governments. Now, is this a good thing or a bad thing? I'd be interested in your opinion. Who would say this is a good thing? Who would say it's a bad thing? Uh, who's not sure? Who didn't put up their hand? <laughs> I don't know. I mean, their theme is, you shouldn't be afraid of your government, your government should be afraid of you. Is WikiLeaks a good thing or a bad thing? Well, we certainly all diplomacy shouldn't be conducted in the public, and employees shouldn't violate their confidentiality agreements, but WikiLeaks is part of a new force of transparency in the world, and sunlight is the best disinfectant for our troubled institutions. The Alliance for Climate Protection. I told you about Bill Clinton and what he said about reducing carbon by 80%. So all of these state-based institutions, they go to Copenhagen and Cancun, they go to Rio, they can't get an agreement on 6%. Not 80%, they can't get an agreement on 6%. Meanwhile, I estimate there are 10 million people, at least in the world, who are self-organizing on this issue. Many of them are in this room. And these people are not just talking about it, or they're not just like on Facebook causes, you know? 200 million people, and some of them go like, and they think they're changing the world. No. These are architects figuring out how to retrofit old buildings to reduce carbon and their children in their schoolyards organizing campaigns to reduce carbon in their community. This is the first time in human history where the world is being mobilized and we're all on the same side. We've been mobilized before around world wars, but we were on different sides. This is a new kind of multi-stakeholder network that's making a difference where the old institutions are failing. Who knows about crisis commons? Hands? This is a multi-stakeholder network that intervenes in a crisis, in the Haitian earthquake, in Hurricane Sandy. I was taught my daughter lives in New York, in the East Village, where Hurricane Sandy hit. And I was talking to some of her friends and they said it was way easier to get to these new self-organizing models than it was to get to the Red Cross. So the Red Cross is a big old industrial age bureaucracy. So I'll give you one more example of these new multi-stakeholder networks that use the internet and try and solve problems. It's called Campus Party. This is a shot I took at Campus Party Berlin the last time I was there. And it was an extraordinary event, like this one. It wasn't as big as this one, but I was quite struck by what happened at that event. And I stayed there for three days, and I'm here throughout the day today and tomorrow as well, meeting people, talking to them about what they're doing, organizing. They even had speakers at Campus Party. Uh, in Berlin, like they do here. This is a number of stakeholders. They're individuals, they're working on individual problems, but they come together, not just in Berlin and Sao Paulo, but increasingly around the world. And you can see what's happening in this room, happening in countries all around the world, and cities all around the world. And that raises a really interesting question for you, sitting in this audience. At your fingertips, you have the most powerful tools ever for creating wealth, for finding out what's really going on with our institutions, for scrutinizing companies, governments, for organizing collective responses, and for solving problems in the world. And with, remember Spider-Man? With great power 
comes great responsibility. How are you going to use this power? Have you thought about it? Have you only thought about your own little project? Or have you thought about what this in this room means? Well, I'm going to try and give you my views on what, what this means. You're part of something that I call, this is all new, by the way, called a Global Solution Network. Now, what is a Global Solution Network? Well, first of all, it has some combination of the four pillars of society. You, the four pillars, government and state, the private sector, the civil society, and the new fourth pillar, you, the individual. You can be a pillar of society. So two 22-year-olds during the Haitian earthquake, they're living in Boston. They go onto the Ushihidi network and they find a little faint message in Creole coming from under the rubble of a shopping center. It's a seven-year-old girl and she's dying. They pick up her message. They translate it from Creole into French. They triangulate her location. They advise the authorities. They go in and they save her life. Those two young people in Boston were pillars of society solving a global problem because the earthquake in Haiti wasn't just a local problem, it was a global problem. So that's number one. It's a multi-stakeholder network. And it's not based on a nation state. That's our model up until now. Only states solve global problems. Number two is, it's beyond one nation and it's addressing a problem that's global. Now, the network doesn't have to be global, but the problem has to be global. Unfortunately, most problems we have today are global, and this criteria doesn't exclude very many networks. Number three, the network seeks to improve the state of the world by helping to solve a problem, develop new policies, new solutions, expose traditional organizations, um, even disrupt things, but they need to be contributing. So this is where Anonymous becomes interesting. See, whether or not you're trying to solve a problem is in the eyes of the doer, not necessarily just the eyes of the beholder. But I think an Anonymous is something that we can debate. But there are the networks that I think we could exclude from being part of this. Al-Qaeda would be an example. I think by any reasonable person's um, assessment, Al-Qaeda is not trying to solve global problems. And the fourth thing is that this network uses the internet and it uses the digital revolution. Now it's a human network that we're talking about here, but it uses technology. And of course, as the net becomes ubiquitous and pervasive, most networks use this. The final thing is that this network harnesses the power of self-organization. It's not top-down, hierarchical, and based on a state. So I'll just tell you a story here. Now, this is a story about Barack Obama, and he's the state, okay? He's a government, but it helps me make my point about self-organization. It was about five or six years ago, and someone sent me an email saying, uh, Don, you know this guy, Obama, he's running to get the American presidential nomination, and he thinks your book, Wikonomics, is the key to winning the presidency and transforming America. Do we have an issue? Are we good? Should I stop for a sec? Oh, you can't hear. Follow Portuguese? Oh, it's working again. Okay, good. Um, <laughs> anyway, he says, this guy Obama thinks your book is the key to winning the presidency and changing America. Go to mybarackobama.com. So I went there, and there was my book right on the screen. It says, we believe in the principles of, of the internet and transparency and inclusiveness. And he says, and the book, Wikinomics by Don Tapscott, he says, 
I'm asking you to believe not just in my ability to bring about real change in Washington. I'm asking you to believe in yours. And I went there and I looked at this and, well, my first reaction was, I am the man. But not so fast. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> but not so fast, Don, because it turns out I'm not the man. You see, there was a Wikonomics community, but there was also a young firefighters community, and there was a single moms for daycare for Obama community. He created a platform whereby 35,000 communities self-organized, and that's what brought them to power. They raised over $100 million. They brought young people into the election. They had been disengaged in the last election. And that's what brought them to power. Now, self-organization. How do you say that in Portuguese? Auto-organization, okay? This has been around throughout human history. Language was a function of self-organization. There, there, there was no um, central committee of the English language that said this will be called a glass. It just kind of happened. Science was a function of self-organization. Government was a function of self-organization. But what used to take place over centuries can now happen very, very quickly. So those are five characteristics of these new global solution networks. Now, I started studying these. I'm doing a multi-million dollar research project, and my goal is to find a better way to solve the world's problems. And I invite any of you who are interested to participate. I'll give you my personal email address at the end. But what we found out when we were doing this research is that nobody knows anything about these things. It's an amazing situation. There's no... It's like the elephant and the blindfolded person. You know, you come up to an elephant and you say it feels like a tree or it feels like a snake. There's no taxonomy to describe them. There's no language. There's no books. There's no best practices. There's no Kennedy School of Government. There's no intellectual property about what is arguably the most important opportunity to save the world. So... What I'm going to do now is I'm going to give you a new language. And I'd like you, as I go through these, to think, what of these am I involved in? This is a taxonomy. You know the term? It's like you're, dis you're studying a species, like fish. You need to have a taxonomy to describe the, the different um, elements that might constitute fish. So it turns out there are nine different types, really quickly. The first one is called knowledge networks. These are networks, they're not like Coney, they're not trying to advocate for something, they're not like anonymous that are trying to break something down, they're not like the Alliance for Climate Change that's trying to organize people, they're simply in the business of creating new knowledge. And there are lots of examples. Some of them like the Stockholm International Peace Research Institute actually predated the internet. But the internet enables us to solve the global problem of knowledge in an astronomical way. So another knowledge network would be TED. Who here has ever watched a TED video? Okay. Another knowledge network would be Wikipedia. Now everyone in this room has been on to Wikipedia, but who here has actually edited or written an article in Wikipedia? Hands, please. All right, well, that's a wonderful thing to do. Those people who just put up their hands, they're not only beneficiaries of a new model of solving the knowledge problem, they're contributors. All of you, go into Wikipedia, write something, fix something. The second type of network are what I call operational and delivery networks. Now, these are networks that actually intervene in a problem and they fix it. So the Ushihidi network, when those two kids saved the life of a seven-year-old girl in Haiti, 
That's an operational and delivery network. Now, these may bypass our traditional institutions. Do you know about Kiva? For some reason, the World Bank can't get a $70 pump to a farmer in sub-Saharan Africa. For $70, a farmer can get a pump, and they stand on the pump, and they can irrigate a whole field that will support a village. So Kiva decides they're, they're a, a global solution network. They're multi-stakeholder, solving a global problem. They say, we'll do it. They've raised $400 million in small $25 donations. This is a very different model than the World Bank. Now, the third type is policy networks. This is crazy. Do you know that we have governments and global institutions that are adopting policies, but they weren't created by governments? They were created by multi-stakeholder networks, by global solution networks. And these networks, they su can support policy develop development, and they can actually create policies. So the International Competition Network is a network that's creating policies for the financial services and other industries. Governments aren't controlling it. Wow, that's amazing. The fourth type is advocacy networks. Now this is where CONI 2012 comes in. These are networks that are advocating a change. We think we need to fight against sexual violence. We need to fight for human rights. We need to fight for peace. We need to find Joseph Kony, the Ugandan warlord. They're advocating a change, and a change by a government or by a corporation. So avaz.org, they have 15 million people that are part of this network that are advocating for change. This is something we've never seen before. Do you know what? When I was a kid, now I'm dating myself here. When I was in college, the war in Vietnam was going on. And I was opposed to the war in Vietnam. And we organized a demonstration that had a million people in Washington, D.C. And it took us 18 months to do that. Today, all around the world, in the last three years, there have been demonstrations of hundreds of thousands of people that have been organized on two days' notice. The internet speeds up the metabolism of dissent, of rebellion in the Arab Spring, even of insurrection. The next type is what we call watchdog networks. Watchdog networks are in the transparency business. They're trying to bring sunlight to expose a problem. So what uh, WikiLeaks tried to do, arguably, was a watchdog network. Something that's less controversial would be Human Rights Watch. They have hundreds of people all around the world, in Syria today, that are deeply embedded in the conflict and are reporting on what's going on, writing reports and attempting to bring the truth to the fore. They're not necessarily um, developing a policy. They're not intervening to solve a problem. They're simply scrutinizing governments and companies. Now, the, the next type is brand new. It's never existed before. It's called platforms. Platforms are technology and organizational infrastructures to enable others to self-organize to bring about change. So you may care about cooking fires. Do you know what the number one source of air pollution is in the world? What, what would you guess? I know when someone asked me that, I guessed automobiles. Wrong. Factories. Wrong. Animals. Livestock. That's number two. That's a big one. The number one source of lethal pollution in the world is cooking fires. People cook inside their little huts with no ventilation, and it's killing them. So you may care about cooking fires, and what you do is you go to a platform, and there are all the resources and tools that are there. The platform's not trying to solve the problem of cooking fires. It's creating an infrastructure for you to solve that problem. 
Now here's one. Um, whoops, I, sorry, I missed that. It's called uh, Sojo. Sojo is this amazing little network. It's growing very quickly. If you care about anything, you can go there and help organize to bring about change. Okay, we're almost done. The second last one, Tim Berners-Lee, you know, invented the World Wide Web. He spoke at Campus Party in Berlin, and um, uh, he's a good friend of mine. And we were talking about this, and he said, you're missing a category. And he argued that there's something called global standards networks, and he's right. These are networks that create standards for something in the world that's important, but governments aren't driving it. Now, the International Standards Organization is a state-based network. It was created in 1947, right after Bretton Woods. Well, now we've got standards networks like the World Wide Web Consortium that are developing key standards for the web, but governments aren't involved. Again, we've never seen this in history. It was always governments that did this. And the final type is what I call a governance network. And this is the most amazing of all the types. These are networks that are actually governing something on planet Earth, but there are no governments involved. And the best example, well, would be ICANN, right? Internet names and the assignment of internet names and in some ways the governance of the internet, which is a rather important thing in the world, is being governed by a network where governments aren't allowed to participate. And you know what happened in Dubai two months ago, right? The old model, the United Nations ITU, International Telecommunications Union, made up of states, and only states could speak at their big event in Dubai, battled the internet ecosystem. Vladimir Putin, the government of China, and others said, we need the UN to take over the internet. We need states to control the internet. Because you know what we could do if states controlled the internet? We could prevent people from telling lies on the internet. We could prevent false information about governments on the internet. So this is a transparent ploy to try and control the power of the web. The UN fought the internet and the internet won. Now they got some help. The US State Department and Hillary Clinton and some other big forces came in. But um, this is an extraordinary thing. So, um, oh, sorry, this is number eight. And uh, the final type is what I call networked institutions. These are organizations that do so many of these things, they're starting to look like the United Nations, but they're not based on states. So, as I mentioned, I just got back from Davos and the World Economic Forum, a meeting of 2,500 leaders from business, government, civil society, academia, the media, and individuals that were there trying to solve problems. One of them was a young man named Tomas de Larga. And I met him a year ago in Sao Paulo with our hashtag Coffee with Dawn meeting. And Thomas asked me about the World Economic Forum and I told him about it. And there's a global thing called the Shapers Movement. These are thousands of young people under the age of 30. Thomas joined the Shapers, he became very active, and Thomas went to Davos. He was at the meeting of the World Economic Forum, and it was wonderful to have him there. So, this is a new model of trying to improve the state of the world, but there are no governments that are driving it. Other examples might be the Clinton Global Initiative or Business for Social Responsibility. So thank you very much for sitting here patiently. It's rare that an audience at a cacophonous place like this would go through nine different types of a taxonomy. So you all get an A for paying attention. Now, this is a very big change that's underway. And I'd like to close with the meaning for you. I think we're moving into a second era 
of democracy and of global problem solving. The first era, we created these representative institutions, nation states, global institutions. But there was a weak public mandate. Citizens are inert. They don't get to participate. We're moving to a second stage now where the internet is bringing about an age of participation. You can participate now in the economy in ways that you previously couldn't. You can not only read a book, you can publish a book. You can not only read the newspaper, you can blog and create a newspaper. You can not only listen to music, you can remix and compose your own music. You can not only use software, you can instantly create software in collaboration with others that can make a real difference in the world. This is an age of participation. And we can move to a whole new model that we still have states, and we still have representative institutions, but there's a new culture of self-organization of public deliberation, of multi-stakeholder activity, and of active global citizenship. What an unbelievable time to be alive in the world today. Now, there is a big problem though. This, what I just described to you is a new paradigm. You know a paradigm? Uh, I, I can use that, I'm allowed to use that word, okay, because I wrote the book, Paradigm Shift. Uh, that was 20 years ago. Actually, I didn't come up with a word. The idea came from a book in the 1950s called The Structure of Scientific Revolutions by Thomas Kuhn. And he noticed, why did the leaders of Newtonian physics fight against Einstein's general theory of relativity? You see, a paradigm is a mental model. And paradigms put boundaries around what we think. They constrain our actions. They're, they're, they're based on assumptions that are so strong that we don't even know they're there. The earth is at the center of the universe. That was a paradigm. The purpose of computing is to automate enterprise processes with the goal of reducing costs, specifically headcount. That was a paradigm in computing. And something can come along in art, science, culture, technology, whatever, that causes a shift to occur. And that's what's happening today. There's a new paradigm emerging, and I described it to you today. And when you get a paradigm shift, you get a crisis of leadership. Because new paradigms cause dislocation and confusion, uncertainty. They're nearly all, always received with coolness or mockery or worse, you know, hostility. Vested interests fight against change. And leaders of the old paradigm are often the last to embrace the new one. Will the World Bank and the United Nations embrace this new paradigm of solving global problems? Will the government of Brazil embrace this new network model of a government and of society and of a democracy? Well, the good news is, in our research, what we found out is that to overcome this crisis of leadership, leadership can come from anywhere. It can come from a head of state, that's rare. It can come from a CEO, CIO, business unit manager, minister in a government. But the most important thing is it can come from anywhere. We documented a story of a clerical secretary who was the key person in the transformation of a division of Citibank. A positive transformation. And she had what it took to be a leader. She willed it. And this is a very exciting message to leave you with. Leadership is not President Dilma's opportunity. It's not the executive of, of the Security Council of the United Nations opportunity. It's your opportunity. And you are doing it here today. I'm so inspired by Campus Party and what goes on here. And this is the tip of the iceberg of a global movement that's going to transcend the world like a prairie fire. And it's going to help us address the terrible challenges and problems that affect the world today. It's going to unite and ig ignite entrepreneurship all around the world. It's a time of great 
danger, but fundamentally it's a time of great opportunity. We have to do this. So I'm not going to speak to you for the next two minutes. I'm going to speak to the TV cameras and to the leaders of our society. We have to do this. You know, we told young people in the world, you work hard, you go to school, you stay out of trouble, you can have a good, prosperous life. We didn't tell the truth. Previous speaker here said, youth unemployment in Spain is 55%. It's 40% in Italy. We're doing a great disservice to our future by denying young people their birthright, opportunity, and happiness. And if we don't do this, if we don't fix these problems, unemployment, poverty, you know, housing, hunger, human rights, then we're going to see a global conflagration that will make the 1960s look like kids' play. You know, the Arab Spring started in Tunisia, and it was called the Unemployment Revolution. There was a big debate about was social media involved in that revolution? And um, the debate was settled. One word, Tunisia. During the Tunisian revolution, what happened was young people would take their, their cameras and they would identify the location of snipers that were killing unarmed students in the street. They would triangulate the location, advise the authorities um, that were friendly, and the friendly armed military units would come in and take out the snipers. You think the internet is about hooking up online? For those young people in Tunisia, it was a tool for self-defense. During the Egyptian revolution, um, what happened was that the people came into the streets and the government tried to shut down the internet which was a big mistake. This is Anonymous's point of view. That the internet, if you shut that down, people can't communicate, they come into the streets to bring about change. In Syria, eight months ago, up until eight months ago, if you were injured in a demonstration, an ambulance would pick you up, take you to a hospital, you'd go in with a broken leg, and you'd come out with a bullet in your head. The healthcare system was killing demonstrators. So two youngsters used Twitter to create an alternative healthcare system. And when you get injured, tweets go out, you get picked up, you get taken to a makeshift medical clinic where you get medical attention as opposed to being killed. So we need to do this. Yeah, you can say Occupy was a bunch of loser anarchists, you know, uh, uh, hippies and dope smoking, you know, this and that. That would be a superficial analysis of the Occupy movement. This is an expression of a generation that wants to see change in the world. And our institutions of democracy are increasingly being viewed as not legitimate. There are other ways to bring about real change. You could call the London rioters a bunch of criminals, and there were criminals, but this is a reflection of a deep-seated concern in some of these communities and neighborhoods. Do you know that last year in the province of Quebec in Canada were the biggest demonstrations ever in Canadian history? Ostensibly, they were about tuition, but they weren't. They were about a new generation that wants hope and that wants opportunity and thinks that our traditional institutions are preventing them from moving forward. I'm speaking to you on camera one, leaders of the world, we need to fix this problem. So what I'd like to do to end, if we could, um, this is a turning point really in history. And I'd like to give you my final thought on what this new Global Solution Network looks like. And I'm about to show you a picture of Campus Party, only it's an analogy to campus party. Um, I've been studying a lot of these self-organizing phenomenon and I thought I'd go to nature to see what we could learn from nature. Bees come in swarms, um, fish come in schools, 
Starlings over the moors of England come in something called a murmuration. And the murmuration refers to the murmuring of the wings of the birds. And scientists that have studied this say they've never seen an accident. Now the murmuration has a function. It warms the birds up for the cold night ahead and it protects the birds from predators. You can see on the right here, there's a hawk, a predator, being chased away by the collective power of the birds. There's leadership, but there's no one leader. Now, is this some kind of fanciful analogy, or could we learn something from this? Well, the murmuration is based on the principles that I just described to you today of a global solution network. It's a collaboration. There's an openness. There's a great integrity that gives the birds the courage to take on a fearsome competitor. Now, imagine for a second, if you will, if we could, um, if we could connect ourselves on this planet through a vast network of networks of glass and air, and we could start not only sharing information, we could start sharing knowledge and sharing our intelligence. Could we create some kind of collective intelligence? Could we create some kind of consciousness that transcends an individual, an organization, a country, a society, a world? Well, if we could do that, we could do some wonderful things. During the Egyptian revolution, people said, Hosni Mubarak, he's too strong. He's going to hold on. He'll never collapse. The kids in the streets will give up. They'll be intimidated. They'll go home. Well, I wrote at the time, no, the kids are not going home because if they do, he will hunt them down and he will kill them. Just like if this murmuration breaks up, the hawks can attack the individual birds who have been robbed of their collective power. I look at this thing and I, I get a lot of hope that this smaller world that our kids inherit might actually be a better one. And that this age of networked intelligence could be an age where we fulfill the promise of a new global collaboration to solve problems in the world, to create wealth, and to govern ourselves on the shrinking planet. This is Campus Party on the screen. You are participating in this revolution. Don't give up. Go forward. Let's do this. Thank you. Pessoal, a gente tem tempo para algumas perguntas, tá certo? Então, vai ter os voluntários aqui, por favor, levante a mão. Né? É, tem dois voluntários aqui. Ok. E quem precisar falar em português, a gente vai traduzir. Se você for falar em inglês, por favor, se avisa antes para ele tirar o, o, fo o fone de ouvido. I'm going to speak in English. So what it is is that in Brazil, we are, we are going through a, like a huge corruption situation. And uh, people are saying that uh, nobody wants to be part of political activism anymore. And I said that no, it's that they just using the wrong ways to do it. So I would like to know two things about empowering women, not for, uh, to run for, 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 for political places, but to empower as a citizen, like a citizenship um, leadership, because they are the ones who will 
teach youngers. They are the ones who will teach the next generation what to do. So I would like to know if you, and especially in Latin countries, I would like to know if you have any idea about possibilities and ways to do this. Okay. Um, you started with the topic of corruption, and then you evolved into the the problems with our existing institutions and engaging people. So I'm going to tell you a story. So um, it's about a year and a half ago. Um, the country of Colombia is doing well. They have a president that's making things move forward. But the city of Bogota was a disaster. The mayor's brother had gone to jail. The mayor was about to be indicted. And the main contractor that was building the mass transit system dug up all the streets and ran out of money. And then he disappeared. So corruption is rampant, and the city government is a complete disaster. So remember I said leadership can come from anywhere? What happened was the Chamber of Commerce of Bogota stepped in to fill this vacuum. And I worked with them. And we mobilized the citizens of Bogota to help reinvent the city and to create an open government. Now, it's not done yet, but we're making progress. It was called the Heartbeat of Bogota. And you can Google it and learn about it or go to uh, dontapscott.com. It's all written up. But what happened was we got thousands of ideas from the citizens, and then these ideas were presented to all of the mayoral candidates to see what they said. And some of the ideas had real teeth. Okay, so here's an all candidates meeting, all the different mayoral candidates, televisions are going. Would you or would you not adopt the International Development Bank software for open procurement for all government tendering? Yes or no? See or no? It's not that complicated. So they all kind of in their own way said see. So now the Chamber of Commerce is working to hold their feet to the fire to make sure that this software is implemented. Because if you implement that software, it's much more difficult to be corrupt. Because it makes all tendering and all procurement be subject to the sunlight of transparency. And you can't give money to your cousin or your brother as easily. You can, there's still ways, but it's a lot harder. So this is one tiny little example of how we can move into a whole new model of democracy you know, we have an industrial age model of democracy. You vote and I rule. Every four years you go pass a vote and you have to do it in Brazil. And a lot of people go into the voting booth and they pass a vote. It's like all our other institutions, you know? There's mass production, mass media, mass distribution, mass marketing, mass democracy, mass education. Something at the top pushes down standardized units to passive recipients. We can now move into a network world where people participate fully. My favorite is mass education, which is being revolutionized by MOOCs today, you know? Massive open online courses. These courses are soon will be bigger than all universities in the world combined, and within a few years, they'll be bigger than all universities combined throughout all of history at one point in time. And it's challenging the industrial age model of education. You know that model, right? One to many, one size fits all, you're a passive recipient. I'm a teacher, I have knowledge, you're a student, you don't. And I am the source of knowledge and I transmit that to you. Well, unfortunately, that's being turned on its head now. So what an opportunity to use these principles to transform the operations of government. And instead of you vote, I rule, it's that you vote and I engage you for insights, for, for the creation of value, for um, your opinions, for all kinds of things. It's a great opportunity. Another question? Yes? Is this Portuguese? Hello? Ah, okay. It's um, me. Okay. It's... All right. Um, on your... Um, okay, got you. 
um, on your TED talk, you mentioned it that the four pillars of the new economy is collaboration, transparency, identity. Okay, in today's economy, when the companies, you know, their majority, their priority of their, uh, their income go to their shareholders, how do you see the four pillars of the economy working with this um, paradox of the today's economy? The, the talk was about the four meanings of openness and the four corresponding principles. So openness is about transparency. It's about sharing assets, like IBM placing Linux in a commons and supporting that. It's about collaboration and boundary decisions, and it's about empowerment. Now here's the thing, that even if you think the only purpose of a corporation is to make profit for its shareholders, you need to adopt these principles because they help you be a high performance, competitive, and profitable company. However, of course there's a growing sentiment in the world that the corporation has greater purposes than shareholder value. We've got, for example, well, just at Davos, there was a big session where people were saying, no, we give corporations a license. Society gives them a license to fulfill certain functions. Sure, to make money for shareholders, but also to innovate, to create products and services, to behave responsibly, to be contributors to society. And there's a, a huge change that's underway right now in thinking about what is the fundamental purpose of a corporation. And the good news is companies are changing their behavior. And they're not changing it because, just because of government regulation. They're changing it because of market forces. Years ago, there was this expression for companies, you do well by doing good. I don't think it was true. Most companies that did well, or many, were very bad. They had monopolies, they exploited their workforce in the developing world, they, had, they externalized their costs onto society, they pollute, they, uh, they put their money into marketing rather than into innovation. But because of transparency, increasingly that expression, you do well by doing good, is becoming true. If you're not a good company, if you don't have integrity as part of your bones, it's becoming more difficult to build trust. It's becoming more difficult to get capability and good employees. It's becoming more difficult in your supply chain because if you don't have trust, you have a lot of lawyers and you have a lot of transaction costs. So again, I don't think I'm naive. I've done a lot of research on this. We know for sure you do badly by being bad. Wall Street found that out. They behave terribly, and they almost brought down the global capitalist system. Now, Wall Street hasn't changed much, but they're being forced to change. Uh, one other thing, you mentioned my TED talk. If you want to see another fun talk, I gave a talk for TEDx. It was called TEDx Wall Street, and it was at the New York Stock Exchange. And it was a very difficult talk to give. I stood up for all these bankers, and I said, Wall Street, we have a problem. You know, there's a growing opinion in the world that the world is becoming more unjust, unfair, and unsustainable, and you're at the heart of the problem. We're going to have to change. So it's going to take time, but I'm very optimistic. Mr. Tepsquad, it's here, uh, grateful to hear your words for me. My name is João Carlos Caribe. I'm from Movimento Mega, which is one organization that is free for internet freedom at Brazil. In search for answers for the increase the, the internet attacks for the governments and the corporations, to soap uh, people, uh, for example, in Brazil, some kinds of laws. I'm doing a research based on your research, in other research, to understand 
what will occur the last year on the world, which the, it was appeared the, the, the way that increased this attack for the governments, for the corporation. You can hear, you, you can, okay, it's fine for you. The answer is completely different for the, that I'm looking for. That question is this, some kinds of people or some kind of scientists Say, talk about the technological singularity. It's uh, I, I don't I don't technological singularity. singularity. It's not okay. You fast. That's not. Uh, I found the other singularity, the crowd singularity, which the people, the, the uh, digital natives, they use the internet different of ours. They use internet more faster than us. They use the internet more effective than it was that we can. You can't understand me. Or you can't hear. I can, I can answer the question. All right. The question is, for me, the singularity is not the technological one. The singularity we, are, we you can expect is the, the crowd singularity, which the youngest, the digital natives, will work hard in the internet, growing up the, the collective intelligences. The growing up, the, uh, the collective intelligence, the collective, uh, they, they can think of the, the brain. So the, the questions, the, the word throw away from my hands. But that's the, the question is the singularity will, will build the, the crowds. These people can work with the internet, the collective intelligence, the cognitive construction of the intelligence more faster than anyone in the world. This could be the answer for this question, and this could be the great problem for the nations with the digital exclusion is so big. What do you think about that? Okay, well on the first question, SOPA and PIPA, and that movement that grew all around the world, not just in the United States, in response um, to these attempts by government to better control uh, the internet, um, they failed. The governments failed in doing that, and they failed because of uh, one of these networks. It was an advocacy network that came together like we've never seen before and mobilized this huge force for change. They even got like Wikipedia involved. Wikipedia was shut down for an entire day. Now, that doesn't mean Wikipedia is an advocacy network. It's still a knowledge network, but networks can do more than just one thing. Now, in the second part of the question, I had trouble hearing you, but let's take it offline here. But the singularity is a, you know, a term by um, Ray, Kurt, Ray Kurzweil, and he has, he's given it a meaning to be when, when technology catches up with human capacity, and this will create a very interesting world. I mean, that's bound to happen at some point. Um, personally, I'm not going to run my life based on the idea that I can stay alive for another 20 years, I can live for 200 years. Um, I don't want to live for 200 years and see all my friends and family die because I have the money to get new electronic hips and heart and everything else. But it's an interesting concept and Singularity University is a, a very important institution where a lot of, um, and it's separate really from that whole Kurzweil thing, where a lot of interesting uh, debates, conversation, education, and so on uh, happen. So um, we're going to close it off there. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.